On the road of life, every step matters. Our decisions not only determine how we walk, but where. Whether difficult or easy, we're given choices along the way. Light or darkness. Love or hate. Truth or falsehood. The question is, what road will you take? Well, good morning. Been uh, fighting a cold, so I have my tea up here and lemon, so hopefully my voice will uh, cooperate today. But welcome. We're glad that you're here with us today. You know, the Reformed theologian John Calvin begins his multi-volume institutes with these words, nearly all the wisdom we possess consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Knowledge of ourselves can be hard to come by. Let's face it, we are a mystery even to our own selves at times. In fact, one of the most common themes that you'll find in film and in, um, in literature is the story of a person running from the truth about themselves. We see it in films as diverse as Aquaman, Goodwill Hunting, Moana, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. We see it in Simba and the Lion King and Jean Valjean and Les Miserables, Luke Skywalker and Star Wars, Neo in the Matrix. Knowing ourselves, the truth about ourselves, is not always easy, which is why we tell stories about the struggle. Last week, we started a new series through the Bible's book of 1 John called Walking in the Truth. And last week, we talked about walking in the truth about Jesus. So today, we're going to talk about walking in the truth about ourselves. As Calvin says in his Institutes, knowledge of God is only half of the equation. We also need knowledge of ourselves. So today, we're going to talk about three falsehoods that we tend to believe about ourselves that can cause us to run from the truth about who we truly are. So we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 to chapter 2 verse 2. So I want to invite you if you're able, if you would stand where you are for the reading of God's word today. This is God's word for us, our Father's word, beginning in chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You can be seated. I mentioned before that John makes two central affirmations about God in 1 John. That God is light, as he says here, 
in chapter 1, verse 5, and that God is love, which he will say twice in chapter 4. Everything in 1 John revolves around these two central affirmations about God, that God is light and God is love. In the Bible, light is associated with goodness and truth. And so to say that God is light is to say that God is good and that God is true. And to say that there's no darkness in God is to say that God is completely good and fully true, that there is nothing in God's nature that is bad or false. And because God is light, God is our ultimate source of what's good and what's true in the world. God's nature is to shine His goodness and His truth into our world and into our lives. And when God does that, He exposes what's bad and what's wrong and what's untrue in our world and in our lives. But God doesn't just expose what's bad or what's untrue. He also reveals what's good and what's true and what's right. This is the very essence of God, because God is light. And this central affirmation about God as light is followed by a series of three falsehoods that we are tempted to believe about ourselves. Each falsehood in this section begins with the phrase, if we claim. If we claim to have fellowship with God, and yet walk in the darkness, if we claim to be without sin, and if we claim we have not sinned. Since God is light, God exposes these three falsehoods for what they are. But God doesn't merely expose the falsehood. God also reveals what's true so we can be free to walk in the truth about ourselves. So this morning, I'm going to talk about these three falsehoods, and I'm going to actually talk about them in the reverse order that we read them. So I'll, I'll address the falsehood of verse 10 first, then in verse 8, then in verse 6, working backwards, and I think you'll see why I'm doing that as we go. The first falsehood I want to talk about in verse 10 is the claim, I have never sinned. That claim, I have never sinned. If we claim we have not sinned. Notice the past tense of verse 10. That this falsehood is the claim that I have never sinned in my past. And the tense of the verb suggests specific concrete actions of disobedience towards God. That in my life I have never failed to disobey God in specific ways. Now, we don't talk about sin very much in our society today. We don't talk about sin a lot even in the church today. We talk about our mistakes, our regrets, our failures, our struggles, but we tend to avoid that little three-letter word, sin, that occurs so frequently in this section. But the Bible talks about sin a lot. In fact, in the translation that I use, the New International Version, the word sin occurs more than 900 times. In the Bible, the essence of sin is missing the mark that God, as our Creator, set for us as the human race. Sin is falling short of the standard that God intends for people created in God's image. And sin can refer to specific actions and decisions and choices and social structures that we create that are contrary to God's will for us. But in the Bible, sin is first and foremost a condition, a state of being, where we exist in a state of fallenness, where we've fallen from God's original intention and we exist in a state of hostility and alienation towards God. Specific acts of sin flow from this condition of sin. And according to the Bible, everyone is in this condition and therefore everyone sins. Everyone sins. 
Most people actually agree with this. A LifeWay research poll two years ago found that most Americans, 67% of Americans, believe that they are sinners. 8% say that they're not, and 15% preferred not to answer the question. <laughs> when we're really honest with ourselves, most people know that life is not as it was intended. That life is not the way it's supposed to be, both in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our world. We just don't like talking about it very much. In the past, churches used to talk about sin a lot, perhaps a little too much. In the past, churches talked so much about sin that you could get the impression that it was the only thing true about us, that sin was the defining characteristic of what it means to be human. And this overemphasis on sin eclipsed the reality that God created us in His image, that God originally called the human race very good. And so it seems that these days we've swung from that extreme to the opposite extreme, finding talk about sin a little too negative, too depressing, too off-putting. But to expose this falsehood that we've never sinned, chapter 2 of verses 1 and 2 give the truth that Jesus came to atone for our sins. Jesus came to atone for my sins. Jesus came into the world to address our sin problem to provide a solution for it. If I've never sinned and if you've never sinned, then God was wrong to send his son into the world for a problem that didn't really exist. And that's why verse 10 says that this first falsehood that we're talking about makes God out to be a liar because God seems to think that sin is a problem in our lives and in our world. John describes God's solution to the sin problem a couple of different ways in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 of our reading. He calls Jesus our advocate when we sin. That when we sin, and we all do, we have an advocate. Jesus is for us rather than against us when it comes to the sin problem. And Jesus is qualified to be our advocate because he is described here as the righteous one. In other words, although the sin problem is universal to the human race, Jesus himself was sinless. He is the only righteous one. This is the consistent claim of the Bible, that Jesus was perfect, that he never disobeyed God. That Jesus was fully human, like us, in every way in our humanity, except that he never sinned. And this uniquely qualifies Jesus to be for us, to be our advocate. The other way John describes how God has answered the sin problem is that Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. To understand what an atoning sacrifice is, you need to picture the ancient Jewish temple sacrificial system. Before Jesus came into the world on the Jewish Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur each year, God's people would go to the temple in Jerusalem in order to find forgiveness for their sins. And each person who would go to the temple would bring an animal with them, usually a lamb, but sometimes other animals as well, to offer as a sacrifice for their sins. The animal was viewed as an innocent victim. And the temple priest would place their hands on the animal, symbolizing the transference of that person's guilt who brought the animal. And then the priest would offer that animal as a sacrifice in the temple. And the word that was used to describe this sacrificial exchange was the word atonement. Atonement. You see, that's what the word means. It means to be brought back into a relationship for the God who is good and the person who has fallen short of that goodness to be reconciled, to be brought at one with one another. And the whole sacrificial system of the Jewish temple looked forward to Jesus' death on the cross. He is our atoning sacrifice. 
He is both the priest that offers the sacrifice and he is the sacrifice itself. He is the means of forgiveness for sin. The way that we are made one with God. And Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient not only for our sins as well, but for anyone's sins that turn to him in faith, for the sins of the whole world. As long as we cling to the falsehood that we have never sinned, we cannot receive the benefits of Jesus' atoning sacrifice. One of my favorite books about the Christian life is by Dietrich Bonhoeffer called Life Together. Bonhoeffer wrote Life Together while he was running an illegal seminary in Nazi Germany, training people for ministry in extraordinary times to live in resistance to the Nazi government. Eventually, that seminary was discovered and shut down, and eventually Bonhoeffer would be arrested and killed in a concentration camp. But the book he wrote, Life Together, presents a compelling vision of what it means to be the Christian community, and he has an entire chapter on the confession of sin. Listen to the words of Bonhoeffer in that chapter. He says, the mask you wear before others will do you no good before God. You no longer have to go on lying to yourself and to other people as if you were without sin. You can dare to be a sinner. Thank God for that because God loves the sinner. Walking in the truth about ourselves means admitting to the reality that we have sinned and that Jesus came to the world to atone for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. The next falsehood is in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin. And at first it sounds like that's saying the same thing as verse 10. But verse 8 is actually a little different. If verse 10 talked about particular acts of sin in the past, verse 8 is talking about the ongoing struggle with sin in our lives today. The second falsehood is this. Now that I trust Jesus, I don't struggle with sin any longer. Now that I've trusted in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, my struggle with sin is gone. John says the person who makes this claim is really only fooling themselves. We might persuade ourselves that that's true, but the people around us know better. Because they can see our blind spots, they can see our flaws, our temptations, our struggles, our failures. It's amazing to me how much energy Christians sometimes put into pretending. I have some Christian friends who prefer their 12-step recovery program over church because they find more honesty there. Walking in the truth about ourselves means admitting, I still struggle with sin. I hope that doesn't shock you today. Our, our struggles may look different. What tempts you may not tempt me. One person may struggle with pride, looking down on other people. Another may be filled with bitterness. Still another may struggle with lust, and another with greed or with envy of others. One person might think that their race is superior to all others. Still another might deal and struggle with an addiction to alcohol or to gambling or to an unhealthy relationship in their life. We all struggle differently, but we all struggle. In fact, one of the things I love about our Reformed theological tradition is the honest realism that we will struggle in this struggle our entire life. That doesn't mean we can't make progress. It doesn't mean that we can't experience victory. But it means that the struggle is real and we dare not pretend that it's not. Listen again to the words of Bonhoeffer. He says, the person alone in their sin is utterly alone. We dare not be sinners in church, says Bonhoeffer. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is discovered among them. 
So we remain alone in our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. To expose this second falsehood, John tells us that God's provision for our ongoing struggle with sin is the forgiveness that comes through confession. Forgiveness through confession is God's provision for our ongoing struggle with sin. I'll be honest with you, I have quoted 1 John 1, 9 more than any other verse in the Bible to myself. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. When we stop pretending and posturing, when we stop making excuses and shifting blame onto other people and circumstances, then and only then do we have the humility and the honesty to confess our sins to God. Confession of sin is intended to be a daily spiritual practice, which is why Jesus taught us in the prayer that He gave us to pray, forgive us our sins. And although John is talking primarily here about confessing our sins to God, there may be times when it also helps to confess our sins to each other. James chapter 5 verse 16 in the New Testament says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It helps sometimes to confess our sins to a safe, confidential person, to a pastor or a spiritual director, a therapist, or a trustworthy, confidential friend. Because God's provision for our ongoing struggle with sin is the forgiveness that comes through confession. Still moving backwards in our reading, the last falsehood I want to talk about is in verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness. Here John describes a person who claims to have an intimate relationship with God through Jesus, but whose ongoing way of life contradicts what God has revealed as good and right and true. If God is light, the source of what's good and the source of what's true, walking in darkness means disregarding what God has revealed and choosing the darkness over the light. You see, because of the impact of sin, our internal desires are no longer a reliable guide to what's good and what's right. Our desires are disordered by the effects of sin. We need God's light to order our disordered desires to show us what's good and right and true. And so the third falsehood is this, that God is not concerned with how I live my life. That God is not concerned with how I live my life. And let me just caution It's more tempting to point this out in other people than it is to see it in ourselves. It's easy to judge how other people might be walking in darkness, particularly when their temptations are different from our temptations. God does care how we live. If God is light, the source of what's right, the source of what's true, then walking in what's not right and what's not true disrupts our communion with God. We can't walk in close relationship with God who is light and choose consistently to live in the darkness. God wants us to walk in the light, to live in light of what He reveals as good and right and true. Walking in the light will cause us to have fellowship with each other. It will draw us closer. And the blood of Jesus, His atoning sacrifice, will continually cleanse us from the stain of sin. And so here's the truth. I am closer to God and closer with others when I am honest about myself. Being honest about myself will draw me closer to God and closer to other people. See, walking in the light is not being perfect. John has already said that's not possible. 
Walking in the light means seeking to follow Jesus and then being honest with where we fall short. Listen again to Bonhoeffer. He says, in confession of our sins, the breakthrough to true community takes place. Sin demands to have a person alone. Sin withdraws the person from community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over that person. The more deeply that person becomes involved in it and the more disastrous the person's isolation. Walking in the light means being honest with the darkness that is still inside of me. So walking in darkness isn't merely disregarding God's light, it is that. But walking in darkness is also pretending to be perfect, pretending to be sinless, acting like I'm unaffected by sin. The more I pose, the more I pretend, the more I walk in darkness. Walking in the light is walking honestly. Seeking to make genuine progress in following Jesus while being honest with the fact that I still struggle and fall short. Now, that doesn't mean that we should reveal every struggle we have with every person we meet. There's such a thing as oversharing. There's such a thing as TMI. We should be wise in how much we disclose of our struggles in what situations we share them. I've known pastors who are so transparent in their sermons, their sermons end up being like therapy sessions where they talk through their problems in front of the congregation. That doesn't help anybody. No, I'm not talking about oversharing. I'm talking about not pretending. God cares how we live our lives. And when we walk honestly before God, being honest with ourselves and honest with each other, that draws us closer to God and closer to each other. Walking in the truth about ourselves means looking honestly at some unpleasant facts. And I hope I have not given the impression that our sin is the only thing that's true about us. Because there's a lot that God reveals to be true about us that we haven't talked about, that are not found in these verses. The truth that we are all made in the image of God. The truth that each of us was designed wonderfully and beautifully to reflect God's character. The truth that every person is unique, with unique gifts and abilities, capable of great love and great acts of of creativity. All of those things are also true about us. But the reality of our sin is probably the truth that we most want to avoid because it's self-incriminating, it's humiliating, it's unpleasant, it's easier to see in other people, the people we judge as worse than ourselves, than to see in ourselves. Walking in the truth of Jesus is not enough, we also need to walk in the truth of ourselves, to stop running away from that part of ourselves, to admit who we really are. And that means trusting in Jesus to be our atoning sacrifice, confessing our sins regularly, being honest about ourselves, to ourselves, and to each other. Those are countercultural ways to live in our culture today. So I'd like to end my message a little differently this morning by actually practicing this. I want to invite Robert to come back up, and he, we're going to take some time while he plays quietly in the background. And I want to invite you, if you're willing, to go before God in silence and to invite God, who is light, to shine that light into your life. And to reveal to you what's right and what's good. For you to confess to him in silence the areas where you have fallen short. The areas where you are fallen short. We'll spend some time in silent confession. 
each of us between us and God. And then at the end of that, I'm going to invite any of you who are willing to, to pray out loud a prayer of confession as we confess our sins to God. So let's go before him now as Robert plays. Speak into our lives. Shine your light. going to put the words of this prayer of confession and I invite you if you're willing to pray this out loud with me merciful God we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the comforting promise of God that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Based on the promises of God, your sins are forgiven. Let's stand as we have this closing song.